Welcome to season four, Fostering Change, the number one podcast in adoption and foster care. You know, each week we speak to the most amazing good humans about topics that touch each and every one of us. If you have a guest suggestion or interest in sponsoring our podcast, please visit us at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Now, sit back, enjoy, learn, get motivated, and let's speak to some fascinating guests. Well, you know what? It has been an another amazing year. You know, I actually said this just recently as I posted about the year of 2022. I think I stayed in like 189 nights in hotels, spreading the word throughout our country about what we all should be thinking about and talking about. And that truly is foster care. And you know, one of the things that I always talk about quite often is the fact that reunification should always be the goal. We first, number one, the goal is not to let a child come into foster care. But number two, when they do come into foster care, that it's reunification. But for my family and for so many others, thousands of families I speak to all over the country and now all over the world, we have to understand that reunification is always not the answer. It's always not the answer. And how we need to talk about this is we need to educate ourselves and educate ourselves about adoption. You know, as I always talk about my five beautiful babies that are on the wall behind me, you know, who would have ever thought that it, I would have a son at the age of 18 that I would adopt, who's now 22. By the way, happy birthday, my sweet boy. Today is your birthday and you know how much your dad and I love you. But my next guest actually has not only started an organization to support families like ours, but has also co-authored a book. I'm so, so excited. I have been following Debbie Riley for many, many years. I find that she has so much information to give us and educate us. I love when I get the newsletter every single month. And Debbie, welcome to Fostering Change. Thanks, Rob. I am so glad to be here and Happy New Year to everyone listening. Yes, yes. Happy New Year 2023. 2022 went by like that. You know, and I love the fact that this is actually airing on my son Alex's birthday. And so I want to jump right in with the fact of, you know, talking about adoption. You know, we, you know, when when my husband and I decided to be foster parents 14 years ago, it was very common to talk about children in foster care are going to be adopted. We know right now they're saying and there's roughly 121,000 children that are sitting in the system waiting to be adopted. And we actually adopted an 18-year-old when everybody told us that we were crazy because of the baggage they come with. You know, what would be one of the myths that you would say to our listeners and viewers when it comes to adoption that people just don't understand? Well, I think one of the myths that you're touching upon is it's it's never too late to be adopted. <laughs> You, you know, I mean, everyone deserves the right to have a loving, nurturing family. And, you know, I've worked with so many young people who, as you said, are in foster care, some who are, you know, at the pinnacle of aging out, some who have aged out, who always say to me, you know, I just wish I could have found a family. I wish there was a family for, for me. So I, you know, I'm, I'm right with you that there's just no, no excuse that, you know, we've got to get concept out, out of our head that, you know, there are children that are not adoptable. That's just right. not true. You're right. You're right. I say that quite often. You know, there's no such thing as a bad child. It's a child that needs to be redirected. And, you know, for me, I'm 56 years old and, and I aged out of the system and without any support, without any family. And now at the age of 56, for the last 12 years, I have had my, as my kids call them, their Grammy and their Pappy, but they are like parents to me. And I yearned for that. And I looked for that. And I happened to be able to be lucky enough at church to find that. And they have opened their arms as if I was their son. And I will tell you from someone who has never been adopted, that feeling of knowing someone is there for you is so, it's so different. It's, it just literally, 
it's changed my life in so many ways, knowing that I have, you know, what I consider a mother and a father, that if anything happened to me, I know they would be there for my children, be there for my husband, but also be there for me. You know, I, I, I want to really talk about the fact that there are so many secrets, the silence of adoption, you know, do you tell your children? For me, we had to because, you know, we're two white men with four kids of color. But do you, do you feel that we're doing a disservice? I've been reading some stuff in the paper lately where people at 40 are finding out they're adopted. And I feel like it's almost like an embarrassment. Well, I mean, you raise up a good point about late discovery. That's sort of what we call it now when when adoptees find out their story late late in life. And, you know, I, I've been doing this work now for over 30 years, and I keep hoping that this conversation is not going to be had because, you know, I, I want to believe that, you know, we've educated the world about this. We've educated prospective adoptive parents. We've educated, you know, uh, providers that support adoptive families that telling is, is essential that they have to know their story and it's painful it's riveting it changes their life forever it can greatly impact the stability of the relationship between the adoptee and their parents when disclosure has not occurred and comes later in life so i i just keep educating that it's just right. something that we have to do we don't keep this a secret and, you know, I think that is one of the keys to success for anything is education. And I don't mean education by reading just a book, but truly educating our community because there are so many myths. You know, with Case, one of the things that I absolutely love about Case, and, and by the way, I did not find out about Case until later into the process of already having our children adopted and already, and, you know, but the fact that you guys are, you know, a national leader in developing being, you know, training to, it, it's just, I mean, people, people think, and this is a thing that happened to Reese and I. So when we adopted our children, we adopted our first four children. They were, they were very young, you know, but people just, you know, it was like, we had all this support prior to the adoption, you know, social workers in our house twice a month, you know, all, every, we got guardian of items. We had casas, we had, and then the, the judge signed the paperwork. And then it was silence. Yeah, yeah. And it was when all of the baggage really started to come out, you know, and we happened to be in, it's in where we adopted, it was a closed adoption. And, but we chose for it not to be closed. And the reason for that is because every single person has a life story. And we always wanted to say to our children, you know what, we did not keep your birth parents from you. Your, you know, there's life was about choices, but I love the fact what Case does is that you guys are actually there to support once the judge signs that piece of paper yeah i mean so we we started you know i co-founded case almost 25 years ago with a another woman kathleen dugan she and her husband adopted eight children from foster care and they had four biological children you know that's a long way back now when they began adopting their oldest is in their 50s so there wasn't a lot known about what we know now about the impact of trauma and deprivation and the long standing implications of unresolved grief and loss and why children struggled the way that they did. And so often she would take her children to providers in the area here and they would tell her to return her children back into foster care that they were too damaged. And she never did, but what she learned and self-taught was that there are needing to be specialized supports that are very different from the general population and wanted to start an organization where post-adopt services would be at the forefront and no family would ever be told to return their children back into care. And that that was the foundational construct of, of CASE. And today we serve, you know, over 600 families and we're working a lot in the pre-adopt of helping children move to permanency and, and youth and teens and young adults. But also, as you said, Rob, is that when everybody goes away, when the celebration ends, the journey begins. Yes. And, uh, you know, you all need the right kinds of supports at the right time. And that's what I'm proud that we've been able to create here at CASE. That's the direct services that we do every day here. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that I, that I, 
it it saddens my heart because you know debbie you know we still have social workers that are still saying well you know you can you can give them back i mean i am very very transparent about my my journey and my husband and i our journey and our children and i have a son you know who we have been told you know several times well you know you can just give him back you know and we're thinking what do you mean give him back he's he's our son he's you know right now i mean you he suffers from reality active attachment disorder he is has defiant disorder they've even said he's possibly bipolar i mean all of the things but i also re think about this little boy who did not ask to go into the system did not ask to come into the system with bleeding of the brain she can baby syndrome and three broken ribs you know thinking of the trauma that that child had gone through the problem is my husband and i were not prepared and 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 finding case was you know something that we absolutely love because you know there is a lot that parents who adopt children from a shattered system and parents who adopt in general by the way let me tell you something we could be talking about the same exact story of a family who adopted overseas you know because we've met these families and you know you don't know what happened between birth to two birth to four those 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 times Times. If there's something, you know, one of the things I love about that I want to talk about with you, Case, is the, the support that you said. You're giving 600 families support, but your national organization, why does that number doesn't seem like it's higher? Is it because people don't know about you or families are too scared to ask for that? I think neither. So the direct service arm is in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. And, you know, I don't want to get into a lot of complexities, but you know, that's the mental health base that of, of where we serve. And a lot of our reach has to do with licensure issues and how you can treat across state, state lines. So uh, how we've sort of expanded to address the need that you're speaking of, because families all over the country need what we have here. And it's, it's not an equitable system of, of service delivery right now in our country because the funding just isn't there to create organizations such as CASE. So, in 2009, I began to think about, because I was getting calls from families like yours in all parts of the country, like, why can't Case be here? We need help. That one way to address this was to build what we're calling now an adoption competent mental health workforce. That I had great training. I was a great therapist, but I didn't know what I know now before I, you know, opened the doors of Case. You know, am I really, my, I'm honored to have been allowed to come into the lives of so many families like yours and learned an awful lot. But what I learned was that there's a specialization of, of support that foster and adoption kinship families desire and need and should have. And so we began to build training programs for mental health professionals and now child welfare professionals and soon to be school-based mental health professionals so that we could build their competencies to better address the needs of families like yours and others across the country. And that's the national footprint. I hope one day, you know, maybe there'll be, we saw it during COVID, less restrictions about, you know, licensure and where you can treat and where you can't, um, so that our wings could span much broader in that way. But for now, we're addressing that through the training workforce development program. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I mean, I'm lucky I live in the DMV. And so to have you right in my backyard and, you know, I've said this to so many people who have even thought about adoption or have adopted that you must learn about case. Listen, everybody, we're getting ready to take a quick break. Again, I we are here with my amazing friend, Debbie Riley. She is the co-founder of Case. Definitely Beneath the Mask is something, if you are even thinking of adoption or you have adopted, and by the way, maybe you've adopted 20 years ago. I'm telling you something. There are things that come up in adoption years later, years later, that you might not be prepared for, but I'm telling you to have support is the key to success. We'll be right back. This episode of Fostering Change is sponsored by Comfort Cases, a national nonprofit that inspires our communities to bring hope and dignity to our youth that are in foster care. For just $10 a month, you can support the Comfort Case mission and help us eliminate trash bags for kids who are entering foster care. For every $10 that you give, 
Comfort cases will give a Comfort XL to a child entering the system. Be part of the change. Visit comfortcases.org. Well, you know what? First of all, I can never say it enough. Happy birthday, Alex. Your dad loves you to the moon and back. You know, I'm sitting here with my friend, Debbie Riley. She's the co-founder of Case. And again, you can go to adoptionsupport.org, find out more information. And, you know, I keep bringing up my my son, Alex, Debbie, because yeah, today is his 22nd birthday. And I remember when, at the age of 18, when I met him, I remember, you know, just knowing this kid had been in foster care most of his life and knowing that the only thing he truly, truly wanted was a foundation, a foundation of love and support. And, you know, my husband and I and our other four children, we fell in love with Alex and he is truly our son. He is, you know, just finished his sophomore year in college and he's thinking of studying, going to London to study abroad. And the one thing he said to me, he said, Pops, he said, that would have never happened happened if you had not come into that school that day and talked to me. And the reason I bring that up, Debbie, is because I think that's one of the key factors that we need to do is that we need to get in front of more people and talk about adoption, talk about the options, talk about the fact that these kids deserve, these kids are our future. I mean, they're our future. If there was if there was one thing that you could possibly do, let's say that magic wish, and I know being national and knowing that, you know, discuss the mental health, but if there was one thing, what would that wish truly be when it comes to adoption? That's a big question. I, I think, you know, from, from my lens is, is for the world to, to understand that while we celebrate adoption, adoptive parenting is different than parenting biologically. And I think that I want the world to know that there, there are sort of these normative issues that present themselves, that the supports need to be aligned for the families. And like you said, you know, many of our families we see 10 to 12 years after finalization, like the, the issues present themselves way, way past that initial day in the courthouse. And I, I wish we could remove some of the biases and misperceptions and wrap our families around these much needed supports without judgment and without barriers to accessibility, particularly from a funding perspective. That was a long answer, but. No, but I, I, you know, I love it because I, you just basically hit the nail on the head when you ended that one comment and said, funding, because, you know, I find it absolutely horrific that we fund so many things and we do not fund enough when it comes to children who truly, one, need this support, families who need the support. But then what happens is the only thing that we do is we fund a new prison because we all know that the, the, the actual system itself is a pipeline to a penitentiary, you know, and if you could imagine, you know, and again, I get a lot of of people who uh, attack me on social media or emails because of my viewpoint. But my viewpoint is for, and it always has been, children should never sit on the sidelines and wait for adults to be adults. You know, I believe that each and every one of us fail as a human. We drop on our knees at one time in our life, but there comes a moment where you must step up and get up off your knees and stand up and realize that, you know what, I'm a parent. And I got to do something. And so, but my what, the reason I bring that up is because I don't believe that there's enough funding, you know, for to number one, I would love to see a campaign go on about crushing the myths of of adoption okay it's too expensive these kids are bad they are you know detention center kid i mean all of the things you know i i you know my sweet boy makai you know he was two years old when he arrived and they literally said to us he's never going to walk and he's never going to talk and they said he was autistic and, you know, all of this, this and that and this and that. And even to the point where they even said, are you sure you want this one? Like as if he was a piece of clothing. You know, I think that, you know, my son, Makai, is 16 years old now. 
and he is the president of the SGA at his school. He walks, he talks, he loves. Kids are resilient. Kids are resilient. And I think with an organization like yours, with Case, I think that we need to do more for people to know that you're out there. Well, I agree. We work hard at that every day to, to kind of spread the word. But again, also not only to spread it, but to help families understand that it's okay to reach out for help. That that doesn't mean that you're a bad parent or you failed. Or for the kids, you know, they don't they don't come, you know, hopping down the hallway a lot of times. You know, I've been doing this work for a really long time and I specialize in, in treating adolescents. So they're a little bit harder, but once they come here and once they see that this is a safe place and that we understand what they're thinking and feeling by being able to talk to them about things that maybe no one has ever talked with them about, it becomes a place that they do want to come back every week to be safe and to talk about these things that are troubling to them. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I love the fact that you keep saying the fact that they, they want to come back because it's a safe place, you know, and even though they could be in a home that's very safe and, you know, very loving, you said it earlier, uh, raising children that are biologically is different than raising children that are adopted. Because if you really look at it, they truly do have two life stories. And, and I think it's always so, so important for kids to know their life story, but it truly, they do have, you know, two life stories, 25 years, you know, that you guys have been doing this. If, if there was one particular kid that stands out in the 25 years, Debbie, you don't have to say the kid's name, you don't have to, but what, do, do you have that one kid who actually stands out after 25 years or that one family? You know, there are lots of them, but, you know, I'm going to show you something that maybe speaks to it better. So I, you know, these are just an example of some of the teens and kids that I've treated over the years. These are masks that we make therapeutically in our work. And each one has a special place in my heart and each one has a special story. I think for me, it's it's knowing that we're still here. The other day I, I did get a call from someone that I saw when she was 11. She's in her late thirties now and is coming in tomorrow for some support because she made a connection, someone in her biological family that has caused some, you know, some issues for her. But for me, being able to pick up where we started over this journey and to be here for her and for her not to have to tell her story all over again, but to just say, I'll see you Tuesday and we can talk about it. That's that's what it's about for me. Well, first of all, I wanted to ask about the mask. From the very beginning when we started this, I wanted to ask about the mask. And now I absolutely love that because each and every one of them are different as, as each and every child is different. You know, and the fact that you get to walk into that office and look at those masks and each one of them, I guarantee you, you know, who made each one and what that part of that story, you know, you, you, you brought this up and it's, it's really opened up my eyes. And I love the fact of when new things trigger where I can, you know, maybe I can go the next step, my daughter. And by the way, my kids are very, know that their dad talks about them all the time. They tell me what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say but my daughter she just recently you know wanted to have some relationship with birth her birth family which we 100 percent supported and it didn't turn out the way she wanted it to so you know i think sometimes we have this dream that you know and it just it wasn't it didn't do that and this has just been something recent that's just happened and it just made me realize that you know maybe reese and i just brushed over it you know and thought hugs and kisses were enough and you know you don't have to worry you know you have two dads that love you and and maybe it was maybe her crying out to say hey you know maybe i need to talk to somebody and just try to analyze why this person, you know, would want me, but then all of a sudden now hurt me. So, wow. Yeah, I mean, that's, a that's you know, what, what we educate and support around that sometimes 
the reunions don't go the way that one wants and those divided loyalties that, you know, she knows that you both love her. But as you said before, there are two stories that are very interwoven. You know, our, our children, I'm an adoptive parent too, my son's 31, have two sets of parents, known or unknown. And, the, and that's, you know, the intricacies of that, of their beautiful, it's sort of a fabric of those threads is, is really important to continue to honor and at times address. And the divided loyalties, I think, present themselves sometimes where maybe she didn't want to share as much of her pain because, you know, that might yeah, be And I also think a lot of times, you know, kids who are adopted, they worry that they will hurt their adopted yeah. parents, you know, right. and, and they carry that pain around that, that pain of, well, you know, I really want to open that door, but gosh, you know, these have been really good parents and I don't want to hurt them, you know, and something that recent, I always tell each of our kids, we don't feel threatened whatsoever. You know, we don't feel threatened because we hope that we've done the, the job that we needed to do and continue to do. Cause my kids always ask me, dad, do you think we'll have another kid? And I say, we never say never, we never say never. Listen, everybody, my friend, Debbie Riley, she is the co-founder of case, which is adoption support.org. Listen, it's 2023. I have heard from so many people who say 2023, you're going to make some changes. You are thinking about adoption. I just had my amazing friend who lives on the West Coast who just reached out to me just last week and her and her husband have made the decision that they want to start looking into adopting do me a favor, reach out, reach out to adoptionsupport.org. The book is be Beneath the Mask, which, you know, totally just is like this aha moment. And Debbie, I just want to say thank you for 25 years of, you know, I, I said this in the beginning, I think that there's sometimes so much shame. I don't know why for adoption or why people don't want to talk about it. But I think that any way you decide to build a family and to make a child know that they're loved and supported is the best thing that could ever happen. So thank you so much. Thank you for being on Fostering Change. And everyone, hey, we all have an opportunity. The opportunity is you can blame the system or you can help us change the system. And I hope that that's exactly what we do. Once again, Alex, happy birthday, my sweet boy. Daddy, you'll see you when I get home. Take care, everybody. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for listening or watching the latest episode of Fostering Change. All of us on our team hope that you've learned something new today and have been inspired to be a good human. Now, just a reminder that you can always find Fostering Change on your favorite channels on Google, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and others including, of course, comfortcases.org. I want to give a big thank you to all of you for joining us each and every week. And a reminder that if you have a suggestion for a guest, or maybe you might have a question about today's podcast, or are interested in becoming a sponsor of Fostering Change, please don't hesitate to email me personally at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Now, that's it for now.